Perfect. So thank you, Steve, uh, for accepting uh, being interviewed in this uh, oral history initiative of the ISCCL. Uh, you as a former president, we want to hear more about your experience and uh, your leadership uh, during your time as a president, but also now in general. What yes, you... okay. Um, okay well, thank but... you very much, Maya, and thank you, Marike. Um, I want to start by just saying that um, I'm recording this interview from my home, which is located on the border areas of Ngunnawal and Gandangara countries, countries that were never ceded. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge the generosity of Australian Aboriginal people who I have worked with and whom have generously shared with me their stories from the heart. Perhaps, Maya, I can just introduce myself before we do the questions. Is that all right? Yes, if you want to. Okay. I am an Australian heritage practitioner and academic whose training, knowledge and experience are in Indigenous and anti-colonial archaeology. I teach in the field of heritage studies at the universities of Canberra and Sydney and am a specialist advisor to the consulting company GML Heritage. My professional interests focus on cultural landscapes, of course, community and social value, the entanglement of cultural and natural heritage, protected area management, indigenous heritage, place attachment, and the emotive and effective qualities of objects. I was the lead author of the Budgebin Cultural Landscape World Heritage Nomination Dossier, inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2019, and the author of numerous edited books, book chapters, journal articles, and consultancy reports. I live on a 60 hectare rural property manage for conservation. So that's it about me. Uh, Maya, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. And actually, it's good for, for, for the first question that I have for you, because, because we want to know how did your engagement with the ISCCL started? And uh, as we know, the ISCCL started to have a focus on historic gardens, and most of the original, let's say, members were uh, either historians of the art or of gardens specifically, or uh, landscape architects. And in, your, and in your case, you just introduced yourself as an anthropologist, archaeologist, much more focused on people. So um, how is that you get engaged in this uh, ISCCL community? Um, well, well I, have a, I don't know if it's a long history or not so long history, really, with the ICCL. And it's interesting uh, what you say about the diversity of the change from what was predominantly um, landscape architects and the concern for historic gardens and sites to a more diverse range of disciplinary interests and broader kind of frameworks of cultural landscapes. But my engagement the cultural landscapes began when I commenced a research project for the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service in the period from 2006 to 2010. The project sought to apply a cultural landscape approach to protected area management in ways that could better integrate natural and cultural heritage in practices of landscape stewardship. The research necessitated that I looked at the ways in which cultural landscapes were conceived and applied in different parts of the world. In 2008, I attended the ECOMOS General Assembly and Scientific Symposium, my first such event, in Quebec, Canada. During that event, I attended one session of the ISCCL annual meeting as an observer. Subsequently, Juliet Ramsey, the ISCCL Australian expert voting member at the time, as well as Australia ICOMOS, supported my proposal to join the ISCCL. Thus, I became what was called a contributing member in those days of the ISCCL and attended my first annual meeting as a member in 2010 in Istanbul, Turkey. Monica Luengo was the then president. For the period of the meeting, Alan, my partner, and I stayed at the same hotel as Canadian cultural landscape scholar and practitioner Susan Buggy whose published writings I hugely admired. Susan and I struck up a friendship through our daily walks to and from the meeting venue, which was the Istanbul Technical University. 
Subsequently, I attended the ISCCL annual meetings in Paris in 2011, in Hangzhou, China in 2012, as well as in Sydney and Canberra in 2013. In the latter case, and led by Juliet Ramsey, I was on the organizing group for the annual meeting. The fond memory of that meeting was being one of the mini bus, bus drivers for the tours to local places. We had a very limited budget for this conference. The group on my bus were keen, even obsessed with wanting to see and photograph a live kangaroo, not a dead one on the side of the road. I'd been saying kangaroos are a common sight in the region. On the road to Tidbin Villa Nature Reserve, the group was so anxious about not seeing a kangaroo, they insisted I stop the bus so they could photograph a road sign with an image of a kangaroo on it, which we did. Needless to say, once we arrived at Tidbin Villa, there were large numbers of grey kangaroos, much to the delight of the passengers and their cameras. In 20, 2013, I became the ISCCL Australian Expert Voting Member, as well as a member of the ISCCL Subcommittee on Nominations and Elections. In 2014, Monica Luengo announced she would be stepping down from the ISCCL presidency. I expressed an interest in the role and subsequently was elected as president in November 2014 at the annual meeting in Florence, Italy. Following that election, and with Monica and then ISCCL Secretary, Stephanie de Courtois, I attended my first ICOMOS Scientific Council and Advisory Council meetings. I then served a three-year term as president until 2017, December 2017, after which Patricia O'Donnell took on the role. In 2018, I was voted as an honorary member of the ISCCL. Currently, I'm a co-chair of the ISCCL Working Group on Nature Cultures Integration, a group established by Fran Han and myself in 2013, and the member secretary for the ISCCL Working Group on Rural Landscapes. I am also the ISCCL Australian Voting Expert member, taking over from Jane Lennon, so a return to my 2012 experience. So really, that's my background and overview of the roles with the committee. Thank you, Steve. That's uh, very interesting. And I have two questions regarding this. One is like, how did you feel like uh, interest in, in, in becoming a, the president or leading this uh, group? I don't know why. I, I'm trying to remember actually why. I think actually Monica approached me in 2013 in the, in the, with the media Canberra and asked if I would be interested in becoming president. I, I was... I was quite shocked at the thought, but also I thought I had something to contribute, so I was happy to entertain the idea. Um, what was the other part of the question, Maya? The... Yeah, about the working groups, because I think originally the there was not such a thing of working groups, and you mentioned the, the working group of, of nature cultures that uh, you started in 2013. So yeah. I was wondering how this... Uh, this started to be a, a model of work for the ISCCN? Um, probably happened from, well, it happened before I joined the committee really. Uh, they didn't use the term working group, but they used, they had these series of projects. So for example, the project developed guidelines on doing um, evaluations of world heritage nominations for cultural landscapes, um, which Juliet Ramsey and Patricia O'Donnell led. Um, and there was a whole series of other kind of, there were more projects and not termed working groups. And I guess they kind of evolved into working groups. And um, I think, I suppose the term was formalised, probably when I was president, but I'm not really sure, because we had increasing numbers of these project groups and we needed to sort of give them formal names and be, I guess it was a kind of administrative thing as the committee got bigger and the kind of work it took on became more. Thank you. Yes, also um, um, this issue of uh, what you are mentioning of the of the growth of the committee, right? It, it has uh, really become something that was only 20 people or so, and now we are around 200. How do you see? Were you the first uh, president that was not uh, a historian or architect, landscape architect, let's say? And if this uh, was something um, 
let's say that uh, that was difficult when when the membership was mostly landscape architects which is completely a different uh, approach i guess uh, of understanding cultural landscapes yeah um i mean i think because the committee originated um out of uh, the international federation of landscape architects um, and really joined up with ICOMOS in 1971 um, to do, as you said, historic uh, gardens and sites. That was the focus for a long time. But I think from the late 1980s, when the idea of cultural landscapes was sort of getting more prominence, um, and particularly after 1992, when the World Heritage Committee adopted cultural landscapes as a category of World Heritage property, um, there was then a growth in the interest in the idea of, of cultural landscapes and particularly because within that category one of the categories was design landscapes which fitted perfectly with uh, the land the, the uh, landscape architect um, interests um, but I do think that the rise of associative landscapes at that time and continuing so-called relic landscapes invited relic landscapes tended to invite archaeologists in the committee continuing landscapes invited sort of um, geographers and anthropologists and um, the associative landscapes also a range of different uh, disciplinary interests so i think um, there was quite a debate in the 90s and i'm sure carmen and non and others would talk about that um, about whether to expand into cultural landscapes, which did eventually happen. And I think once that happened, that then opened the doors in a way to a diverse range of disciplinary um, people joining the membership. Um, and I think that was a, probably a gradual thing because it was still noted, I suppose, when I joined around 2010, that there was actually a lack of anthropologists in the group, for example. Um, and we might even say there's not that many historians, though, of course, many of the landscape architects are also historians. So um, it did diversify, diversified, um, obviously, from a disciplinary point of view, but also I think as ICOMOS um, grew and the committee grew, it also grew in terms of geographical diversity. And um, there was significant um, range of people from different parts of the world. Um, joined. And I think, um, I'll, I've got a few things to say about the numbers a bit later, but I think there should be no limit on the numbers of the committee. I think it's a fantastic thing. And if people really have an interest and a willingness to commit to the work of the committee, then there's no reason why it can't continue to expand, obviously, despite the complex issues around administration. Uh, yes, thank you, Steve. And about your experience as an anthropologist, archaeologist uh, leading the group, can you say something uh, or what uh, challenges you encounter or if it was uh, very smooth? I'd say in general it was pretty smooth. Um, I, I don't really remember or any particular resistance to my background in archaeology and heritage. Um, Personally, I was deeply fascinated by all the people who were landscape architects because I'd never met so many. And, uh, and I was deeply intrigued by the field in which um, they were working in the diversity of places, which um, at those annual meetings, we got to visit these most incredible and amazing places. And often they were gardens and historic houses rather than necessarily bigger landscapes, but that did happen as well. Um, particularly, I think, when we went to Jeju Island in 2015, there was much more of a focus on landscape than probably there had been before at these meetings. But no, I don't think there was really any uh, resistance that I was aware of to me not being a landscape um, architect and being president of the committee. Mm. Do you want to tell us uh, some important moments that you recall from your experience as a as a member of the ISCCL? And of course, there are so many. So I'll focus on the period from 2014 to 2017 when I was the president. So I'll start with some important moments. So during my presidency, the uh, ISCCL annual meetings were held in Florence in 2014, coordinated by Luigi Zangheri on Jeju Island, South Korea in 2015, coordinated by Professor Jong Sang Sung 
in Bath, UK in 2016, coordinated by David Jarks, and in Delhi in 2017, coordinated by Nepal Kanaproti. These meetings were attached to global scientific symposia, including the ICOMOS Scientific Symposia in Florence and Delhi, the Rethinking Landscape, Linking Landscape to Everyday Life Symposium on Jeju Island, and the Capability Brown Conference at the University of Bath in the UK. These meetings, like all ISCCL annual meetings, were brilliant opportunities to meet and connect with many wonderful people from a range of places and disciplinary backgrounds. Uh, they were also a huge amount of work by a lot of people to coordinate and ensure that the work of the group progressed well. Along with the hard work, the meetings were great fun. So I treasure, for example, the opportunity to have danced with the Jeju Hanyo, the women divers at the Hanyo Museum on, on Jeju Island. What a privilege. Um, I can mention a few important events. And of course, the annual meetings, as I've mentioned previously, were and are important events. But I see the adoption of the two ISCCL prepared doctrinal texts by Ifla and Ikemos in 2017 as significant milestones in the work of the committee. That is the ICOMOS IFLA principles concerning rural landscapes as heritage and the ICOMOS IFLA document on historic urban parks. Both documents were initially driven by individuals, Leonella Scarcosi and Eva Ruoff respectively. For me, it was a huge learning curve to coordinate their development and shepherd them through the complex ICOMOS process for adopting doctrinal texts. And I've written a little on that experience in a paper published in Historic Environment, which is the Journal of Australia ICOMOS. Actually, I almost missed the adoption of the two resolutions of the 2017 ICOMOS General Assembly. I was in a side room of the wrestling auditorium, which was the venue for the General Assembly, where I was working with a group finalising the texts of the Yatra or Tamana. It was a tremendous feeling being present for the adoption of these doctrinal texts. And I remember as they were being passed, I looked across the auditorium and I saw Monica Luengo. We were both almost screaming with joy and delight. Um, I think because it had been such a long journey and that it was a very powerful emotional moment. So also at that time, working on and presenting the 2017 General to this 2017 General Assembly, the Yatra or Tamana, was also a great experience and privilege. The Yatra or Tamana Declaration, which means our purposeful journey, our wishful aspirations for our heritage, recognised that nature culture's domains are inseparable, encompassing biocultural diversity, geodiversity and agrodiversity, and the multiple perspectives of disciplines and worldviews. So in terms of what we were talking about earlier, Maya, it really points to the diverse, the change from specifically designed or landscapes or historic gardens and sites to much broader interests being developed in the committee. So lastly, I'll just talk about some important people, but of course, Anyone who's a member or supporter of the committee is an important person in my view. There are so many of us over the 50 year history of the committee. I wanna mention a few here. So Monica Luengo, what a fabulous person. So intelligent, multilingual, inclusive, respectful, and always incredibly generous. It's been a privilege to get to know Monica to have been mentored by her in the role of ISCCL president, and to have shared so many great times. I treasure the moment with Monica when we introduced her to the big merino, an enormous monument to a merino sheep in Goulburn, Australia. Monica had previously given a paper at the 2013 Australia ICOMOS conference on transhumance and sheep movements in Spain. Juliet Ramsey was always supportive of me becoming involved with the, work of, with the work of the committee. She was also a great mentor for her strong views, advocacy, tenaciousness, and action on issues that mattered to her and her commitment to the work of the committee. In 2015, I had the honor of meeting Sonia Bergman in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Sonia was a former vice president of the committee. 
Ellen and I were on a holiday in Latin America after traveling to Antarctica. Sonia and I had arranged to meet for coffee. She generously shared the harrowing story of her activism to prevent damage to an urban park through development and the consequent suit issued against her by the Buenos Aires local government for US $2 million. It really is a shocking and deeply distressing story and event. She also told me about the time she and others chained themselves to the Columbus Monument in opposition to its removal. So there's commitment and activism. Stephanie de Courtbar was the ISCCL president while I was secretary while I was president, as well as before that time. She was a wonderful person to work with and a great worker and colleague at the annual meeting. It was also a great honour to meet and engage with Diane Menzies, her capacity for high quality work, particularly with the ICOMOS Working Group on Indigenous Heritage, has been both important and inspiration. As a previous president of IFLA, Diane brought considerable international experience to the committee, and I've enjoyed continuing to work with Diane outside of the work of the ISCCL. Nepal Prodi is another wonderful person and great contributor to the work of the committee. She joined as a contributing member around 2014, was the Indian co-chair of the 2017 ICOMOS Scientific Symposium on the theme of heritage and democracy, and is now on the ICOMOS board. I'll also mention Paulette Wallace, a young and emerging professional who was part of the ISC ISCCL for many years. She jumped in and did a great job with preparing a policy position on young and emerging professionals for the committee. Paulette also brought a considerable intellectual contribution more generally through her PhD research on cultural landscapes. There were so many people who inspired me in the work of the committee. Nora Mitchell, David Jart, John Sang Sung, Chun Si Wang, Brian Han, Saul Alcantara, Carrie Gotchis, John Zvona, Elizabeth Brabeck, Leanna Jensen and Marika Franklin. Hi, Marik. Natalie de Halle, Willie Cumming, Liu Jean, Jane Lennon, Virginia Laboranti, Jochen Marx, Mete Egan, Darwinia Neal, Darwin Neal, Kirsten Mance, Makiko Ishikawa, Pat Green, Aigula Gia, Anna Greth Dietz, Shidawan, Mabel Conson, Gitti Homer Irani Bahani, Mary Lahine, Fernando Britos, Diana Henriquez, Jörn Boosman, Miriam Ledet, Brenda Barrett, and many, many more. And I apologize for not mentioning so many other people. And now there are so many new members of the committee, including you, Maya and Marike. I really do thank everyone I've met and engaged with in the time with the committee. It has been incredible. So these are some of the important people, events and moments that I will always value. So I did go on for a while there, but there's a lot to be said, I think. Thanks, Maya. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, uh, this is uh, really, really rich what you are sharing with us. And uh, now the next question would be what, uh, I mean, I see that your time in the committee itself is uh, 10, a bit more than 10 years but you have been also involved in ECOMOS and well, heritage in general, but what has changed since you started in the, in the ISCCL to now is a brief time, but uh, still maybe you can see, you can point at some changes. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, there have been a lot. Um, so I think the committee has continued to become increasingly inclusive, as we talked about earlier, with an increasingly diverse membership. So, for example, I, I, I think there's been a great increase in members from Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and they are an active cohort in the committee's work. So, gracias, and it's great to see that group. Similarly, the committee has seen a gradual increase in the young and emerging professionals, which is also great to see. I've especially benefited from the presence of observ observers, many of them being students who attend the annual meetings and some of whom then go on to become members. So when I started with the committee, there were debates on the numbers of members that could be elected from any one country, including, for example, the USA, Italy and Australia, which already had a lot of members. 
While I understood the reasons for this opposition, I have been opposed to it because I think that anyone who wants to join the committee and be engaged in its work should be supported in doing so. Limiting numbers, in my view, is elitist and unnecessary. During my presidency, I brought this debate to a conclusion with the expert members assembly voting to not limit the number of members from any one country. It is probably still a controversial decision for some members and welcoming of observers to the annual meetings has been an excellent way to attract and engage new members. The committee has almost always been represented by women and many strong women at that. The committee has a positive history of strong, intelligent and committed female members. I think female participation and leadership has been significant in creating a positive and inclusive culture within the committee. I've already mentioned the increasing engagement of young and emerging professionals, and for me, that's a real wow. Despite these positive steps, I think there are a challenge for the committee is inclusiveness related to affordability. To be a member can be really expensive in terms of travel and accommodation to attend meetings and to have appropriate technology to participate in remote events. And to be the president is mega expensive. Not everyone can afford to do this. The pandemic has shown us how we can move, be more inclusive through technology, even if we miss the face-to-face -face -face meetings with colleagues. Finally, the dominance of English in the work of the committee remains a challenge for inclusion of a linguistically diverse membership. I look forward to technologies enabling a more level linguistic playing field where apps can more easily enable communication across multiple languages. So I think I'll leave it there on those observations on changes in the committee. Thanks, Maya. Thank you, Steve. Um, and this, I think, relates, I mean, this next question also relates to what you mentioned before about the doctrinal texts that uh, you've been part of or that happened during your uh, presidency. Uh, but beyond this, maybe what uh, do you think have been the major contributions and impacts of the ISCCL work? Um, well, I'll probably start from the early days, and I really think the Florence Charter on Historic Gardens, which was adopted by ICOMOS in 1982, was hugely significant in changing of understanding of heritage from a Western perspective. It really was a powerful document for recognising cultural plantings as dynamic forms of heritage and the associations or intangible heritage that designed landscapes can hold for communities. The change in name from historic gardens and sites to cultural landscapes was also a milestone for the committee, as I suggested before. It signalled a shift from a specific site type to more, to more inclusive forms of heritage. Although not a committee event, the expert meeting at La Petite Pierre, France, 1992, was momentous and included many members of the committee, including David Jacques, Susan Buggy, Hans Dorn, and Pierre-Marie Tricot. The La Petite Pierre meeting authored what is now Annex 3 of the UNESCO Operational Guidelines for the Implementation of the World Heritage Committee. Another important contribution was the role of the committee and particularly Monica Luengo in developing and promoting the Florence Declaration on Heritage and Landscape as Human Values in 2014, which was adopted by the 18th ICOMOS General Assembly. The declaration set out principles and recommendations on the value of cultural heritage and landscapes for promoting peaceful and democratic societies. In many ways, it preempted preempt ICOMOS's great work of rights-based heritage by, via the ICOMOS Common Dignity Working Group. And in fact, I would point to that document as perhaps the moment when there was a real change from a focus dominated by historic gardens to much broader interests. I think, as I've mentioned, the adoption of the ICMOS IFLA principles concerning rural landscapes as heritage and ICMOS IFLA document on historic urban park, public parks were, were milestone moments in my view. And finally, I want to mention the Nature Culture Dialogue sessions, which were proposed by Marie-Kate Franklin in 2019 and coordinated by Marie-Kate and me. 
I think they've been significant for engaging with other organisations and people from a diversity of disciplinary and practice background. Again, in, in, uh, showing the sort of range in which the committee works in. So I'll, I think I'll just leave it at those with those uh, major contributions. For me. Thank you, Steve. And with that, uh, I would like to ask you where, where do you see the ISCCL going and uh, which directions do you see the ISCCL should take? Uh, well, it can be difficult to see into that crystal ball with the world so dynamic at the moment, but some of the directions for the committee uh, would seem to me to be as follows. First, I think there'll be a greater engagement with the local. The committee has and continues to make significant contributions to world heritage, in particular in recommending members to ICOMOS for desktop reviews and te technical evaluation missions for world heritage nominations under the cultural landscape category. This is important but working toward better processes and practices for cultural landscapes at the local level is something that I ex expect to see increase, particularly as the committee's membership expands and diversifies. Second, and following on from this, I see greater roles for national scientific committees on cultural landscapes and the interactions between the ISCCL and these committees. Again, a localising of the committee's work and engagement. Third, I see a positive future for the committee because of the present group of young and emerging professionals who are so engaged, capable, and generally fabulous. Fourth, and in the coming four years, I see a role for the committee in participating in the implementation and objectives and actions arising from the IUCN ICOMOS Memorandum of Understanding on better collaboration in natural and cultural heritage integration. This is a great opportunity to promote, review and revise the concept of cultural landscape in real world practice. I am very excited about this project and pleased to be engaged with the ICOMOS Secretariat, IUCN and ICROM in furthering, as are you, Maya. Fifth, I see the growth of technology as enabling greater levels of participation and inclusion in the work of the committee. It may mean less travel and more virtual meetings, and this will need to be measured against effectiveness, outputs and outcomes. A continuing challenge will be the levels of administration to make all this work productively. Finally, I would like to see the committee engage more deeply with the work on heritage futures. This is a significant and increasingly important construct of heritage, mostly driven by academia, but increasingly taking, ta uh, taking on uh, in applied practices. The idea of heritage futures necessarily means engagement with climate change, sustainability, rights-based heritage approaches, and ethical approaches that are cognizant of future generations and planetary ecosystems. It will be great to see how change manifests in the committee, particularly in the coming decade, and its significant issues for people and planet and the ways in which we conceive and care for cultural landscapes. So I think I'll leave that there for now. Thanks, Maya. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I don't know if Marike would like to add any question that she has uh, herself to Steve. Thank you, Steve. This is really, really insightful and it's really great to hear and tap into your stories. Um, I was wondering if, if you have to, had to single out any one of the um, one of the moments that you recall, which one would be the most um, life changing, or in terms of your professional career, or your profession, or your personal life? Um, was it the moment you danced with a woman in the uh, zoo, um, or was it perhaps your first meeting in Quebec? Uh, which one would you highlight? Um, I guess it was very scary and also exciting when I was felt like I was thrown into the deep end when I became president. Um, and what happened was the day after I had to attend the ICOMOS Scientific Council and then the ICOMOS Advisory Committee meetings 
fortunately, I was um, uh, attended them with Monica Luengo and Stephanie de Courtois. And while we were attending, um, they were sort of uh, whispering to me about what was going on and how things worked. And I noticed that everyone around this room were busy on laptops. There were messages flying around about issues. And so I tried to engage in the, on my laptop with some of these conversations. But the consequence was that um, I was missing what the actual conversation in the room was. And I remember Monica saying to me, Steve, Steve, put your hand up, put your hand up. And I said, what, what, what? And she almost pushed my hand up. She says, you have to vote on these. This is important. So I then decided I'm uh, really not a multitasking person and I'd better just stick to the listening to the meetings. So as I say, it was those meetings, I mean, it's a funny thing to point to when there's so many different things. But for me, uh, it was delving into the complexity of ICOMOS, how it worked, what it tried to do. and and. Um, I, although it's a, a very complex uh, animal, ICMOS, um, it, it is fascinating to try to understand, and I don't claim to understand anything, but the complexities of how it works uh, and, and how it gets things done. And it does get a lot done with a very small secretariat and a very big passionate membership. So I'll point to that uh, as well. Of all the... As, say, cultural landscapes that you've traveled to all over the world, which one had made the, the, the biggest impression um, on your, I don't know, on your <laughs> experience? Mm. Or... Oh. <laughs> you do ask challenging questions. Um, well, it, I, I mean, being in the committee and having been president, is incredible for the places you visit and the people you meet and the histories you learn about. So that's very difficult. I mean, Jeju Island was amazing. Um, uh, the visit to the, um, around Florence to the Medici villas was, and the gardens was absolutely incredible. Um, very hard to say, but I am going to jump back to an Australian one and say the budget bin cultural landscape probably had an enormous impact on me because I worked quite closely with the Gunditjmara, who are the traditional owners of that uh, place, which is now World Heritage Listed Property. Um, and in trying to understand the values, understand their um, ambition for caring for the place, um, and caring for the future of their own Greenwich Mara community. Um, so for me, it's been an incredible privilege to work with the Greenwich Mara at that place, to learn from them. I mean, writing the um, nomination dossier was really fantastic in the sense that um, I would do lots of writing as with other people, we'd come together and the the particular way in which the Gunditch Mara, and particularly a guy called Damien Bell, who's the CEO, would say, no, we can't use, that's not the language, that's too colonial, we can't say that, um, we have to frame it in another way. And um, I found just incredible, incredible learning experience. And so one example of that is the use of Hunter Gather, which I even hate saying these days, but um, they, they, and I agree, see the use of, of that term hunter-gatherer as very colonial, as very denigrating of Indigenous people in Australia and having profound negative consequences on the histories of those people. Um, and so for me, that kind of learning about, from an Indigenous perspective, the kind of language that some of us take to be basic in, in some of our disciplines like archaeology and anthropology is in fact deeply offensive to many people and I now don't use that term. So that's a long-winded way of saying our budget in cultural landscape is a fabulous place but so are so 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 many others. Thank you Steve. <laughs> do, you, do you think we will be able to visit Budge Beam in 2023? Uh, yes, it's on the cultural landscape tour around um, Victoria in, in southeastern Australia, and um, it, and you will get to meet um, if it happens. I'm 
please make it happen, um, then you will get to meet Damien Bell and many other of the wonderful Gunditjmara people who love and care for that place and which is part of their traditional country. So, yes. Um, Steve, would you like to add something to close the, the interview? Um, I might say a, th a few things about the role of the committee and then I'll just, I'll finish on a couple of anecdotes maybe. Um, is that okay if I do that? Yes, please. Okay. So um, I think the role of the committee is pretty much well stated in the new bylaws. And they say that the committee researches and promotes the understanding, protection, conservation and management of cultural landscapes through ISCCL member collaboration and working with ICOMOS, IFLA, other international scientific committees and other organisations with parallel interests and objectives. So they're the words from the bylaws. Beyond this, the committee has a history of bringing people together from diverse geographic, cultural and linguistic backgrounds to build networks of practitioners and understandings of cultural landscape and heritage from diverse perspectives. In my own practice, I have learned a great deal about how cultural landscape is conceptualised and understood by Australian Aboriginal peoples, for example, as the Gunditjmara, the traditional owners of the Budjbin cultural landscape, which I've just talked about. I've also learned a great deal from meeting with and talking with, for example, Fran Han and Ruren Zhang on the application of cultural landscapes, a very Western framing, in the context of Chinese worldviews framed as the harmony of people and nature. So for example, Fran Han has written on how the concept of cultural landscape has experienced difficulty in the areas of theory and practice in China. And with particular reference to the listing of the World Heritage Properties of Lushan National Park, which was inscribed in 1996, and is a spiritual mountain for Buddhism, Taoism and Confucianism, and Mount Wutai inscribed in 2009, a sacred Taoist and Buddhist mountain. In essence, these listings as cultural landscapes, a form of cultural site um, rather than a mixed site as originally proposed by China, severed the inextricable connection of nature with landscape and cosmological beliefs, according to Fran. In other words, inscribing such places as forms of cultural site served to work against Chinese philosophies of harmony and oneness with nature. Nevertheless, China has reframed the construct of cultural landscape to better fit Chinese philosophies. And this can be, this can be seen in the nomination dossier for Westlake Cultural Landscape of Hangzhou. Incidentally, a dossier with considerable input by ISCCL colleagues, Liu Zhan and Fran Han. Ruan Zhang and I have just submitted a journal paper on the challenges of getting Westlake Cultural Landscape of Hangzhou World Heritage listed because of the differences between Western heritage and Asian worldviews and philosophies. So I think we can learn much from such intercultural dialogues, and I certainly have. Um, and the, I, the committee is a great facilitator of these conversations and thinking. So as I said, I'll finish with a couple of anecdotes. Um, so I talked about when I first went to the scientific council in meeting in 2014 and my anxiety and excitement. Um, the next one I went to was I attended the Fukuoka Advisory Committee meeting in 2015 in Japan and I was more on my own but did sit, sit next to the enormously experienced and knowledgeable Crystal Buckley, a recent member of, the, of our committee and for nine years a previous vice president of ICOMOS. Early on in that meeting, Andrew Potts from ICOMOS US spoke to ICOMOS's engagement with the IUCN nature culture journey at the forthcoming 2016 IUCN World Conservation Congress. The reception seemed a little lukewarm. So I asked Crystal if it was possible to have a resolution in support of Andrew's proposal. Yes, she said, put your hand up. So I did, this time freely and was deeply encouraged by the meeting's willingness to engage with IUCN at this event. However, an issue in the debate on the resolution, which was for me, was that there appeared to be an undertone of resistance linked to homophobia, to be frank, and a reminder that we need to be aware of issues of equity and that they need to be continually addressed. 
And the last little anecdote I mentioned is when I was elected president of the uh, um, uh, ISCCL, um, Monica Luengo organized this little mini ceremony where I was sat down and she bestowed upon me a crown of thorns in um, this very fabulous villa we were in having the meeting in Florence. And um, it was, of course, incredibly generous of Monica, incredibly fun on her part. Um, and it was just um, really for me becoming president was really such a great moment. And I think that little, little um, ceremony um, captures really the sort of the, the fun, but also the seriousness and the work of the committee um, in ways which kind of always make me inspired and happy to continue to be a member. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Maya and Marika. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for sharing all these experiences, anecdotes, insights. Um, I think this is uh, very good for all of us, especially new members to learn and understand better the work and what is our role from now on. Um, so thank you so much for your um, sharing. Um, and Pleasure. then I think we can uh, finish this uh, conversation, but um, I mean, you know, this uh, project is ongoing. And so um, we have some, um, let's say some deadlines for the, for the 50th anniversary, but uh, it will continue over time. And maybe there will be other chances to share other more specific um, issues that we can discuss later on. I think that would be great. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people have to say in their interviews. And I do think um, I have been to uh, an interesting session in the Australian Archaeology Association, where sometimes they have these interviews where they have perhaps uh, an experienced member and then a, an emerging professional, and they uh, engage in a dialogue about the things and I think if we do get to ever meet face to face again I think those kind of things could be um, one they're great fun but also beneficial to sort of understandings of people's different perspectives of the committee how it works how it has worked and how it might work so uh, yes I think there's a lot we can do with the history the 50-year history of uh, the committee thank you thank you